Happy to be here with all of you guys. Hope you guys are coming off of a great week. I know my week was good. Spent some time in Phoenix this past week. It was like 100 degrees warmer there than it was when I left. So that was quite nice. Uh, do we have any campus students? Campus students? Congratulations, campus students. You made it through another semester. No, nobody's excited about that. Uh, <laughs> I know, for me, I'll speak for myself, I'm taking, my, my, I'm taking classes for my MBA, and I finished my last paper on Friday, and I'm super, super grateful for that, because I am so tired with school, I'm so tired of school. I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, but hopefully, even if you guys weren't on campus or you don't take classes, um, I hope you guys came off a good week. Guys, can you believe that 2016 is almost over? I can't. This is insane. Two weeks from today, we will be in 2017. Isn't that wild to think about that just the time has gone by, the year is drawing to a close, next week is Christmas, hope you guys are enjoying all the Christmas music, but I don't know about you, for me 2016 has been, man, it's been a wild ride. Um, I mean, most notably, Natalie and I moved to Fairbanks, and then we had a child, I mean... I think those are, the, those are the big things, but I mean, outside of that, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that happened throughout the whole year, and it, it's just been a, a great, a great time. And so it really is that, that time of year to, to sit down, to reflect, to think about the year that has come to pass, right? 2016, what has 2016 brought for you? How have you changed in 2016? What have you learned this past year? How are you going to continue to learn? And what are you going to continue to change in 2017? Again, it's that that time of year to start reflecting, to start asking those questions, to make sure that we're continuing to push ourselves forward, to learn and grow. Does anybody remember this past year's theme scripture? Romans 12.2. What does it say? We've been talking about it quite a bit. Do not conform to the things of this world, the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be transformed by, the by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to attest, then, you, test, then you'll be able to test and approve, and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's right. Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How have you transformed in 2016? How have you transformed and how will you continue to transform in 2017 i encourage you i really do to sit down just take time like block out time in your schedule sit down and ask yourself questions like these think reflect and plan for 2017 this morning we're going to continue our little mini series on the characters of of christmas and last week we looked at two groups of characters we looked at the magi and we looked at King Herod, and we looked at their very vastly different response to Jesus and the announcement of Jesus' birth. We had, on one hand, we had King Herod, who is threatened by Jesus, who is threatened by his power, threatened by his authority. And on the other side, we had the Magi, who were excited, overjoyed about the announcement of Jesus, this King of the Jews. And while Herod came to look for Jesus in order to kill him, The Magi came to worship him, to give him the glory that he deserves, to praise him. So over this past week, have you been more like the Magi, more like King Herod in your relationship with God? Here to praise him, to worship him, or have you had more of a tough week, right, where you're more likely to want to maybe not kill Jesus, but... (laughs) Rebel against him, rebel against his authority, try to do things your own way. Again, it's a good thing to continue to ask ourselves these questions, to reflect on our weeks and how we're really doing in our relationship with God. This morning we're going to look at two new characters from the Christmas story that were actually very uniquely impacted by the announcement of Jesus' birth. In fact, they were very directly impacted by him, because they were the ones that were in fact tasked with raising this new child, Jesus. So yes, we're looking at Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph this morning, and we're going to take a look at how they reacted to the announcement 
of Jesus' birth as both the mother and stepfather of Jesus Christ. And so I think these two extremely important characters give us a lot of great insight, and they set an amazing example for us when we think about our relationship with Jesus. We think about how we respond to the presence of Jesus in our lives. I think they set us a great example of how we can do that. So let's go ahead and we'll pick up this Christmas story here in Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, excuse me. We'll look at Matthew chapter 1 in a second. But we're, going to start with, we're going to start with Mary. And we're going to take a look at this first moment that she heard about Jesus. So Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Go. There we go. Oh, Romans 12 too. That was there. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26 says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive... Is in her sixth month. For no word for God from God will ever fail. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Ladies, for just a moment, I want you to put yourself in Mary's shoes. Put yourself in Mary's situation. What would you be thinking if an angel came to you and said, Oh, by the way, You are going to have a son, even though you're a virgin. You're going to have a son. You're going to conceive. And, oh, he's going to be, you know, the son of God. (laughs) Just, Just a heads up. It's going to happen. Imagine how you would feel about an announcement like that. Imagine how your life would be shifted and changed in that moment. What would you be thinking? What would you be feeling? It'd be so incredible to imagine just this, how different your life would be. Now, gentlemen, you're not off the hook either, because Joseph also had to deal with this thought and process through this. So let's take a look now at Joseph's reaction to all of these things happening. Now we're in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, this is how the the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. So as we look at these two reactions of both Mary and Jesus, there's some pretty astounding things that come to mind. Because you've got to realize that because of this announcement of Jesus' birth, both Joseph and Mary were placed in a very uncomfortable situation. For one, Mary is now physically going to give birth to a child that she was not planning to have. She was going to mother a child that she was not planning to have. And on Joseph's side, his wife was really inexplicably suddenly pregnant. And now he was going to be the stepfather to a child that in their mind, in their planning, in their thoughts, was not, that was not the plan. That was not what they thought was going to happen. And you know what? I, can, I feel like over the last couple of weeks, I can relate just a little bit, just a little bit to 
this kind of sudden <laughs> announcement of being a father. Or Natalie, for sudden announcement of being a mother. Because I was the one, actually for me, I was the one that took the phone call from our so- social worker, answered the phone, and she said, hey, we have a, we have a child that was born just the other day, and um, would, you, would you like to be shown? Would you like your profile to be shown for her? And we were like, yeah, of course. And this has happened probably six, seven times before. And so we had honestly kind of hardened ourselves to protect ourselves that, okay, it might not be this time. It might not happen. Whatever. Yeah, go ahead and show. But we weren't, I, I will speak for myself, I was not necessarily very faithful about it because it had happened so many times before. And then about half an hour later, I get a call from the social worker and said, she says, oh, you've been selected. Like, oh, okay, yeah, you've been selected, so you need to come to Anchorage. Like, it was no big deal. <laughs> and in my mind, I just, it was unreal. This is unreal thought of suddenly how different my life was going to be. How different our lives were going to be. And so I feel like just a little bit, we, we, we had this, we can share this same sentiment that maybe Mary and Joseph had. Just, what? This is so crazy that our lives are going to be so changed, so different than maybe what we had thought. And of course, I know that Mary and Joseph's situation was very, very different, but I still, I feel like we can share that same little sentiment. And in fact, Mary and Joseph's situation was actually quite a bit more extreme, obviously because, for one, it's, you know, the Son of God. (laughs) That, That makes a big difference. But what you have to also remember is that looking at this perspective from the outside in, given the culture of the time, this is actually a really bad situation for Mary and Joseph. A really bad situation. Because Mary and Joseph at this time were betrothed, but they were not married. So what that meant is that they were supposed to have no sexual intimacy at all in their relationship. So the fact that Mary suddenly becomes pregnant puts her in a very bad spot in the eyes of the society around her. And so you got to imagine, she would have realized instantly the stigma that she was going to face. She would have realized instantly the, the shame that she was going to face because outside people looking in were not going to understand what was going on in her life. Honestly, try to think about explaining that. No, uh, the, the Holy Spirit came and it's, that's, that's how I'm having a baby. <laughs> believe me, right? No, nobody was going to believe her. Right. Nobody was going to believe her. So she knew instantly that she was going to face a lot of judgment, a lot of stigma against her for this little boy that she was going to mother. And yet, do you see her response? Yeah. She says, let your word be done to me as you say. Let your word be fulfilled for me. I am the Lord's servant. Let's do this. And take a look at Joseph. Take a look at Joseph and think about where his perspective was. Right? Again, suddenly his betrothed, the, the woman to whom he's betrothed, is pregnant. Again, inexplicably so. And again, think about Mary trying to explain this to him. Like, oh, don't worry, it's the Holy Spirit that has impregnated me. So, what do you think Joseph's thinking? He's thinking, yeah, no way. Like, Mary's been messing around. Right? Mary's been making some bad decisions, and because he was a righteous man, what his thought was is like, okay, you know what, obviously this relationship is kind of weird now, so I'm just going to divorce her quietly. He didn't want to subject her to shame, which was nice, because he could have. He could have absolutely, he probably could have had her killed, actually, but said, no, we'll quietly divorce her, because obviously this is not going the way that I thought it was supposed to go. But then, in a dream... An angel of the Lord comes to him and says, you know what? No, it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to your betrothed, and you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Jesus. How does Joseph respond? Says that he did exactly what was commanded of him, took Mary home as his wife. So when I look at the example of Mary and Joseph here, when I look at what they did, you know what I see? I see an incredible Example, two incredible examples of radical obedience to God. I see two examples of people who are willing to be pushed way outside of their comfort zone in order to obey God. 
two examples of people that were willing to go against the grain of society, to go against all of what anybody thought about them at that time, to go outside of what was considered right in order for them to do what God wanted them to do. So I have a question for all of you. To what extent are you willing to go to obey God? To what extent are you willing to go to obey God? Joseph and Mary made a huge sacrifice by choosing to obey. They were willing to go against all of the social norms in order to obey. Are you willing to do the same? Are you willing to go against the grain of society to obey God? Because here is the reality. This is a real thing that we face each and every day. The reality is is that true Christianity flies in the face of so much of what society tells us that we should do or should be. Christianity opposes so much about of what the world says we should be and how we should live. Just think about some examples. Think about sexual purity. Think about the priorities of life, the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money. Think about the concept of eternal consequences. The world on every one of these levels does not share the same thoughts that Christians share. And so you know what that makes us? Weird. (laughs) It makes us weird. And let's face it, we were weird before we were Christians, right? We were already standing out. But Christianity legitimately makes us stand out and makes us very weird in the eyes of the world. And for a lot of us, that's really hard. It's really hard to be weird. Because what do we want? We want to belong. We want to fit in. We want to be part of the society in which we live. But what that desire does to us at times, if left unchecked in our faith, what it does is it causes us to compromise. It causes us to water down the gospel. It causes us to think, well, you know what, if I can just make it so that I can fit a little bit better and I just don't do quite, I don't obey quite as extremely as God wants me to, I might not be so weird. I might fit in just a little bit better. And so what we can easily end up doing is we can easily compromise our faith. We can easily compromise our obedience to fit our societal mold. But is that the type of faith that God wants us to have? No. He doesn't want us to have a faith that compromises. He wants us to hold up to the Christian standard. And yes, it is hard. It is challenging to hold up to that Christian standard. Because again, it makes it so easy for us to water it down so that way we can fit better. But that's simply not the true faith that God expects of us. He expects us to stand up for his word. Take a look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This was a scripture that comes to mind when I think about this idea of wanting to radically obey God in any way, shape, or form. And this is Paul here. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For I am not ashamed. Not ashamed of the gospel. So when we, when we water it down, when we try to compromise so that we can fit a little bit, that's being ashamed. That's being ashamed of what God calls us to be, what God calls us to do. Paul calls us to be unashamed, to be willing to stand out, to be willing to challenge that societal norm around us, to be different, to be a light for others. So how do you show that you're not ashamed of the gospel? How do you demonstrate day in and day out that you are not ashamed of what God calls you to do? Not ashamed of who God calls you to be? Are there areas in your life that you still are ashamed? That you still, you just, you're not willing to push that barrier? You're not willing to push yourself out of the comfort zone there. And so maybe you just don't want to quite totally obey yet. What are those areas for your life? Are you tackling them? Are you, are you dealing with them in order to get to a place in your relationship with God that you need to be? Right? To be willing to totally 
radically obey him. By being obedient, even in the face of society's thoughts and ways, Joseph and Mary again set a great example for us. Great example for us. To take that idea of radical obedience, to apply it in our lives. But by choosing to obey, by choosing to go after this, it did result in some pretty serious some serious consequences for Mary and Joseph. Their lives were totally 100% changed. 100% altered to be on God's plan now, not just their own. And one of the things that they did when they chose to obey, they took on huge amounts of responsibility. And that's the same in our lives as well. When we choose to obey, when we choose to pursue God this way, when we, pursue, when we choose to go after Him and His Word, God gives us huge amounts of responsibility. And once again, when I look at Mary and Joseph's story, I, can, I feel like I can relate a little bit to this idea of responsibility. Because now that I have this little girl, I'll hold her at night, and I'll look at her and I'll think, who in the world decided that I was responsible? <laughs> Who in the world decided that this was a good idea? Because I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, I wonder if, I wonder if I put baby or baking grease in the formula. I wonder if she'd like that. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if you know, I just left her here and tried to get some other stuff done and just let her cry it out. I wonder. There's all these like weird, wild thoughts that are going through my mind, and then I, I think about them, and then I'm like. Why do I have a child? Who trusted, who trusted me with this? It's a huge responsibility. She's this little tiny soul that is totally helpless and completely reliant upon Natalie and I to, to help her live. That's a big responsibility. Again, I feel like I can a little bit relate to Mary and Joseph here. But again, think about Mary and Joseph. Not only was this just a child. We have a child. She's great. She's not the son of God. I don't know. She's definitely a daughter. So anyway, but imagine now Mary and Joseph, like, oh, okay, you're going to have a child, but this is the son of God. This is Emmanuel. This is the child that is going to save the world from its sins. Imagine the responsibility that they felt. Even when I think about Aspen, I feel the responsibility. It's, it's like a, a, almost a tangible feeling of Oh my gosh, this is really big. But imagine Mary and Joseph here. The responsibility that they must have felt. And again, this is the reality of our relationship with God as well. When we choose to obey him, God gives us huge amounts of responsibility. Do you feel it? Let's take a look at a couple of examples. A couple of areas in which God gives us massive, resp- massive amounts of responsibility. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting sin, people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God We're making his appeal through us. This is probably the biggest responsibility that could ever be placed on our shoulders. God has entrusted us, his family, Christians, with the responsibility of the ministry of reconciliation to help people find a relationship with him. God works through us to help people find a relationship with him with him. And what does that mean for us? That means that we play a role in people's eternal salvation. Small role, don't get me wrong, God does all the heavy lifting, but even for us to play a small role in whether or not someone makes it to heaven, whether or not someone lives forever with God or not, that is a huge responsibility for us. This is a massive responsibility. Our words, our actions have a profound impact. So that's one responsibility that God's given us. How about James chapter 1, verse 27, another responsibility that God has given us. Religion 
that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The responsibility that God has given us here, helping the helpless. At this time, widows and orphans had almost no recourse, no one to help them because of the way that society was structured. And so James says here that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to take care of the widows, to take care of the orphans. So what's our responsibility as Christians? We're supposed to be those that are willing to go help the helpless, to serve the neediest. And it's too easy to look at other people, to look at their family members or their friends or government welfare programs or whatever other programs are out there. And we can easily say, well, it's their job to take care of the needy. It's their job to take care of these people that need so much help. But no, it's your job. It's our job. It's my job. It's why we're so focused on trying to serve in this family. We understand that responsibility that God has given us to serve those most in need. Another responsibility that God has given us, Galatians chapter 6. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. What's the responsibility here? To do good for all people, but especially the family of believers. To take care of one another in God's family. To love, to support to spur on, to encourage one another, to hold one another accountable to the standard to which we profess, the scriptures, the Bible, to hold each other accountable to living out the Bible in practical ways, to build real relationships. Christianity was not designed as a place that you're supposed to show up to on Sunday mornings and have fun church and sing great songs and say, yeah, that's awesome, and go home and do nothing. No, it's a family. Family sticks together. Family happens and occurs and evolves and changes 24-7. You can't escape family. (laughs) For better or for worse, sometimes. But that's our responsibility. To engage in that family. To be willing to support one another in this family. To get invested into God's family. As opposed to check in. Check out. Check in. Modern day Christianity, that's what it is. Check in. Check out. Show up on Sunday. Sing some songs. I won't see you for seven days, and I don't want to see you for seven days. I'll check in. Check out. It's not what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be family. And we're supposed to take care of one another. So this is just great. three great examples of the responsibility that God has given us. And there is much more. Do you feel it? Do you feel the responsibility? Because the, thing, the things that we just talked about are huge. Huge. What incredible responsibility God has given us. But you know what? He's also given us so much. He's given us skills, resources, abilities. He's given us his word to guide us that thoroughly equips us for every good work. He's given his his family members, his his sons and daughters, he's given us the spirit to guide us, to do more for him. So God has given us so much. But you know what Jesus says about those who have been given much? Take a look, Luke 12, verse 48, starting the second half of verse 48, so I'll call it 48b. It says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. We've been given much. And so God expects much. Much is asked of us. So how are you doing with your responsibility as a Christian? As a member of God's family? Has your obedience to God pushed you to take ownership of these areas? To do more, to do good for him? something that we have to think about. He's given us the resources. He's given us the tools. We need to use them to glorify Him. 
And again, as I look back at Joseph, and as I look back at Mary, I see that this is exactly what they did. They accepted the responsibility because they were willing to obey. They said, God, let it be done as you say. I want it. Let's go after it. They obeyed God and they fulfilled the responsibility that they were entrusted with to raise the Son of God from an infant to an adult. What a great example that they set for us. And you know what? As Jesus does grow and he does become an adult and he begins his ministry, you know what I see him do? I see him follow the footsteps of his parents. I see him following the example that Mary and Joseph set. Because you know what Jesus did? Is he came and he obeyed God. Radically. He obeyed God, even to the point of death. That's what Philippians 2 says, that he was obedient even to the point of death. And he took on responsibility. Huge amounts of responsibility in order to serve us. And you know what? You know what the responsibility that he took on was? He took on responsibility for our sin. He was punished. He paid the price for our sin. If that's not radical obedience, and if that's not taking on a huge amount amount of responsibility, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. And so as we close out this morning, we're going to take communion. And what is communion? Well, it's a time to remember Jesus' incredible radical obedience. It's a time to remember the responsibility that he took on to give us a chance at salvation. To give us a chance to be right with him. And so yeah, we're going to take communion. And so in a moment, the, the bread will be passed, the tray of bread will be passed that represents Jesus' body. The tray will be passed that includes juice that represents Jesus' blood that was spilled for us. And as you take the communion this morning, I want you to remember Jesus' ultimate act of obedience, his ultimate act of taking responsibility. And so when you take it, I want you to think about your obedience. Take about, think about your responsibility that God has entrusted you with. Make a decision this morning to take on that responsibility, to live it out, to fulfill that responsibility, to obey God and give him the glory that he deserves. Let's go ahead and pray for the body and blood of Jesus. Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you give us great examples, as always, in your word, of people that help us to see how we can live for you. Thank you so much for Mary and Joseph and for their example of being obedient to you, for their example of going against the social grain, and for taking on huge amounts of responsibility, Lord. God, help us to do the same. Help us to fight the fight against the societal norms, the societal mold that we so often face that sometimes makes us want to compromise our faith. But instead, let us stand up. Let us stand up for your word. Motivate us. Help us. Give us those resources and tools that we need to stand up, to be a light, to be weird, and to be proud of it. God. And help us to take on the responsibility that comes with obedience to your word. Whether it is making an impact through helping seek and save the lost or it is serving those that are in most need, or if it is just simply taking care of one another in your family, God. Help us to feel that responsibility. Help, help us to take ownership for that responsibility, God, and do something about it. And Lord, thank you so much for your son who came down for us to offer himself as a sacrifice so that way we can even be talking about this, that we can talk about the obedience and the responsibility that we have. Lord, it's, it's your son that makes all that possible. And again, he acts and he demonstrates the perfect example of what it means to radically obey and to radically take on responsibility as you gave it to him. Help us to imitate his example, God. Help us to love you more, to walk with you closer, to, to learn from these moments and to give you the glory again that you deserve. God, we love you so much. We praise you. It's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. Amen.